a presentation on the new territory of learning and development. We're going to talk about trends in learning technology. And I think you'll find some of these very interesting. There's some really, really exciting new developments going on in the learning technology world here. Just to introduce myself, my name is Jake White, and I'm a uh, CPLP, and I'm the CEO and founder of Torch LMS. It's a learning management system, and we focus on simplicity and uh, really focus in on the small to mid-sized company that needs uh, a very easy-to-use learning management system. So we're going to be talking about a number of different trends. First off, we're going to talk about cloud or software as, a sol software as a service solution and some of the trends that are going on there. Second, we'll talk about some of the new things going on with social learning. We'll talk about next generation SCORM. This is a, a very interesting topic. We'll, we'll emphasize this, this area because um, a, a lot of the learning community uh, hasn't seen what's coming here and this is going to really, uh, I think, be a huge change and, and disrupt uh, the industry in, in many ways. We're going to talk about mobile learning a little bit. And then we'll just briefly touch on a couple of other important trends that are going on uh, with learning technology. So first off, um, I think it's important for every organization to look at what, how do you typically respond to technology, to new technology, and where are you in the te technology adoption curve? Are you an early adopter? Are you part of the majority, the late majority, or a laggard? And I think with each of these trends that we're going to be looking at, it's very important to, to think about what's your organization's culture. Um, are you the, the type that are the early adopters you are willing to take some risks and help iron out some of the, the wrinkles in, in early technology or and, and to at the same time get a competitive advantage and be a first mover with some of these technologies? Or are you a latecomer and you want to wait till it's it's pretty secure and uh, make sure that it's going to catch on and be widely adopted. So that's, I think, the, the most critical thing as we look at each of these technologies, you'll want to assess where is your organization um, in terms of it, how it adopts to, to new technologies. So the first trend we're looking at is cloud computing. So let's, let's just uh, look at another quote here. Um, Deloitte Consulting has said, all businesses would be well advised to begin to develop uh, develop experience with cloud computing platforms as an early stage to better prepare themselves for the disruptions that lie ahead. So they're they're talking about the importance of seeing what how cloud can help your your company become more competitive. And a lot of companies, even Fortune 500 companies, are moving to cloud solutions like Google Docs, where they're moving away from Microsoft Office and bringing their whole workforce uh, to solutions like Google Docs that are that are free or or very inexpensive. So a basic definition of cloud computing, um, access to applications via the internet on multiple devices without having to install or host on your own server or device. So very, very basic definition of cloud computing. Um, there are actually several different types of cloud computing. Um, there's software as a service, there's platform as, as a service, and there's infrastructure as a service. We're going to focus mostly on software as a service here for a minute, uh, since this is the area that most of us are, are working with uh, in the learning area. So software as a service has um, at least five different primary benefits here. So first off is software as a service solutions, like LMSs, learning management systems, that are all done in the cloud. So they're not, they're not hosted on your premises, on, on your servers at your location. So one of the, one of the benefits there is all, it's, there's, it's versionless. There's only one version of it. You're not waiting on installing the next version. You don't have all, a learning management system company doesn't have different clients on different versions of their system. Everybody has the latest and greatest and, and all the latest enhancements. So that's a huge benefit there. Um, and, and it also, typically, you're not paying more to, to, to upgrade to, to the latest version. So that's a, that's a huge benefit of software as a service. Scalability and lower cost is another big piece. Because of the economies of scale that software as a service solutions can provide, um, they're able to scale 
to, to huge numbers of users and reduce costs uh, significantly. Um, and one of the real big big benefits there is that you don't have to ha uh, have the huge upfront licensing fees that you would have with, say, a lot of Microsoft products or other installed products where you're paying huge amounts of money. You've got to take that to the board, and it's a capital expenditure and so forth. With software as a service, it, you don't have that big upfront fee. It's just more of a consistent fee, uh, pay as you go, pay for what you use type of a model. So it's really great for that scalability, lower costs, and you can expense that through a budget rather than capital expenses. Number three is it's there's usually no maintenance. Um, you don't have to put a huge burden on your IT department. So they don't have databases to, to handle and upgrades and so forth. So that low maintenance is, is huge. Rapid deployment is another big area. If you're trying to put a solution in place and get an immediate business impact, um, that can be a huge uh, differentiator for your company to put solutions in place quickly. And then number five, this one surprises a lot of people, but software as a service solutions are highly secure. And uh, that sometimes that's counterintuitive for people. I've had a lot of uh, knockdown dragouts with IT managers uh, when we're trying to sell a company, get, get the training department that comes and says, we love your learning management system, but our IT department doesn't want to move to a cloud solution. And so we, we talk about security and because they want to put it behind their firewall on their own servers. Um, but the fact is most software as a service companies put a ton of resources into security, whereas a, a company, you know, that, that's got their that's got uh, installed solutions, they're not going to put all of those resources, those same level of resources behind security. And so, uh, this was really interesting. Someone from Deloitte brought this to my attention. They said, you know what? If you look at lists of data breaches, there's a number of sites out there where you can see a list of data breaches that have happened over time. If you look at those lists. Every single one of them that you'll see on those lists is installed behind someone's firewall. Um, even big companies like Sony and Apple and, and so forth have, have had data breaches and it's behind their firewall. So when people throw a fit about security, there are some very compelling reasons to look at software as a service as um, the solution to security, not a problem for security. Okay, so on this area of software as a service or cloud computing, uh, your organization, you'll want to look at uh, this, this needs assessment or these areas that uh, would drive you to have a software as a solution, solution so software as a service solution. Uh, number one, uh, if you have limited capital investment funds for software, that would be one reason to go with a solution like this. Uh, limited IT resources would be another reason. Um, you can push a lot of the support, maintenance and everything to, to the provider. Um, a need to deploy quickly. Um, would be another driver, and then finally, um, you prefer a pay-as-you-go, pay-for-what-you-use type of a model um, where you're paying along the way. So those are those are the things to consider as you're looking at uh, moving to software as a service. So the next trend we'll look at is social learning, another area that's been a big buzz, um, but it oftentimes isn't well-defined. So we'll look at what it is and some of the issues around social learning. Uh, first, a, a really basic definition of social learning is use of Web 2.0 or interaction online to learn. Really basic way to think of that. So Web 2.0 is interaction between people online, and using those tools to learn is, is what social learning is about. So Burson and Associates has broken down social learning into these four different areas. Conversations, connections, content, and collaboration. So if you think of these as the, the four C's of social learning. So we'll, just, we'll look at these briefly. So conversations would include blogs and forums or discussion threads. Um, microblogs includes Twitter, um, chat, and, and so forth. So you can see some of these solutions that, that are out there that would be included in conversations. Uh, second area of social learning is content. Content sharing with tools such as RSS feeds and with WordPress and, and SharePoint and others where you're tagging content. Um, some would put this in the category of knowledge management, um, but this is another way to share content broadly across uh, a, a large user base. Uh, third is connections. So having user profiles 
and being able to connect with other people, uh, particularly subject matter experts, or, or for a lot of people, of course, use LinkedIn and, and, and face, Facebook for recruiting and things like that. So it's really connecting people with others of similar interests or similar uh, skills. And then finally, the fourth C if, of social learning is collaboration. So that includes wikis and workspaces and project management tools and, and so forth. So just a couple of examples here. Um, this is from salary.com. This is an example of uh, what they call a talent profile. So you can see a, a number of uh, different fields here on job title and work location and, and data pointed and, and so forth. So, so this is a way of, of connecting with someone based on their profile. Uh, another example, this is from a tool that Skillsoft has where people can actually recommend books to other colleagues and you can follow each other and uh, see, you know, it's basically a little forum where you can share information there. So just a couple of examples. This is from our solution, Torch LMS, and this is a, a discussion thread where you can actually click on the little heart and subscribe to a discussion, and then it'll show your subscriptions and it'll automatically no notify you every time there's an update to a the discussion thread that you've subscribed to. Uh, another, another, uh, option in our solution is what we call an expert directory where you can search for people by skills or areas of expertise and then see a list of, of subject matter experts in that area and you can connect with them. So the idea there is to connect people uh, with subject matter experts. So sometimes it doesn't make sense to go to a class on something, you just need to call the right person and have your question answered. Here are a few books that, that I found really uh, helpful in learning more about social learning, a book called Lost Knowledge, um, Crowdsourcing, and Wikinomics. So those are three that I, I highly recommend to learn more about how to use social learning uh, to drive uh, value at your organization. So a needs assessment for social learning, uh, if you have many subject matter experts across multiple locations, that's gonna be a big driver to, to implement social learning at your organization. Um, if there's a threat of losing knowledge in the coming years, you've got a, a large percentage of your workforce is the, the baby boomer, boomer population. Um, as that group exits the workforce, there's a lot of lost knowledge that, that goes with that. And, you know, there's some examples in the book, Lost Knowledge, um, like we don't know how to get to the moon anymore at NASA, for example, uh, because lost knowledge retired and left, and we literally don't know how to get to the moon, and they're reinventing that. They're trying to reverse engineer how we did that. Um, so that happens at companies as well. The brain drain can really harm organizations. And then the need to increase communication between units would be another driver. And then have a culture that seeks to harness all employee ideas, knowledge, etc. So if, if, if R&D and, and driving in innovative new ideas is important, you obviously want to have a, a forum, a place where people can, can uh, add their best ideas. Okay, so the, the third a uh, trend that we're going to look at here is the next generation of SCORM. This is a really interesting area um, for anyone that's involved in learning technology uh, in any way. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about this here. So first of all, problems with SCORM as it exists right now. Um, first, first of all, SCORM is over 10 years old. Uh, the latest version of SCORM is SCORM 2004. Um, and I think the guys that put that together are kind of kicking themselves for calling it SCORM 2004 because it looks like they haven't done anything on it for a long time. Um, second, the technology it was built on is no longer the norm. A lot has happened in technology since 2004. Um, it's a complex um, format or, or architecture. Um, it only tracks single learners and only tr tracks within a course. Um, it can't track web 2.0 experiences and there's a number of other limitations. So. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about um, a company um, called Rustiki has been partnering up with a government agency to on a project they call the Tin Can Project, where they've been working with communities to find out what do people need in this next version of SCORM? What kind of learning is out there? Um, do we want to track people that have viewed a YouTube video or did they go to Facebook and, and contribute there or contribute to a discussion board or uh, a blog? And, and some of these Web 2.0 tools that are out there 
um, we can't track those. We can only track things that are existing and residing within a learning management system. And so there's some real limitations to the way SCORM is done now. And so they, they've teamed up and created these communities where they've really looked at how do you track things like games and uh, simulations and, and other, other types of content. So um, eventually the Tin Can project is turning into the Tin Can API. So this API will interact with lots of different types of technologies out there uh, from learning management systems to connect um, and interact with a lot of other uh, technologies that are out there like YouTube and like Facebook and, and other tools out there. So it solves a lot of the problems of the older specifications uh, that, that the old SCORM suffered from. It adds a lot of new uh, capabilities um, and it's not going to require that content exists strictly inside of a learning management system anymore. So just to give you a really basic idea of how this new SCORM format, the next generation of SCORM, how it's going to work, is it's based on this very basic logic here. I did this. A noun, a verb, and an object. And, and you can put whatever you can imagine in those three categories, and that's how the, the, the tracking will work. Okay, so as an example, in this first category, an individual, a team, an instructor, um, you can put pretty much anything in that category. Uh, in the verb category, they watched, they read, they attended, they demonstrated, they blogged, authored, taught, you name the verb, and it will track that, which is really huge. Um, and then the object or the thing that they've completed, um, it could be they viewed a URL, they completed a simulation, um, they completed a quiz, they viewed a document, they, they played a game and, and, and won, um, or other types of metadata. So this gives you kind of an example here. So I've got a, a brief video here uh, from the guys at Rustiki who are developing this next generation of SCORM. And this video will just give a bunch of different examples of what's coming with this new technology. And this, I, I believe, is going to significantly disrupt how learning technology is, is, is used and, and, and what we're going to be able to do in the coming years. So take a look at this. Okay, so that gives you just a little bit of an idea of where they're going with this, this project. It's, it's very exciting. Um, the, the other piece of this is you're going to see some changes happen with learning management systems. Again, that, that it's not going to, content's not going to be self-contained in a learning management system. It's going to happen as what they're calling a learning record store. And you can see that you're going to have different types of content speak to this learning record store that will basically all be captured in tools like learning management systems so that you can have reporting on any number of different activities. So for further study, you can, you can check out uh, Advanced Distributed Learning, uh, which is the government agency that oversees SCORM, and uh, Rustiki, who's their partner that has done a lot of work uh, developing SCORM. Okay, next trend we're going to look at is mobile learning, uh, another 
big area that you see uh, in, in, in these conferences. Eric Schmidt, uh, the CEO of Google, has said, if you don't have a mobile strategy, you don't have a strategy. And obviously, mobile devices are becoming uh, ubiquitous. This is, this is uh, a great graph that kind of shows the difference between computer units or, or devices that have been uh, sold as opposed to smartphones and emerging devices like tablets. And you can see that um, in, toward the end of uh, 2009, uh, smartphones and emerging devices significantly passed computers. So these are, obviously these devices are ubiquitous. Um, everybody has them and learning is being pushed to these devices in a number of different ways. So the most obvious way that, that mobile devices are used in learning, of course, is that users have to be able to access training from all their different devices, um, typically through a learning management system. A couple of the problems or, or issues um, that I think are, are most relevant uh, for, for those of us that, that deal with learning technology are number one, instructional design for mobile. Um, instructional design really is a, a, a different animal for mobile devices. Um, it, you really do have to do some different things to, to author content for mobile devices. And sort of a subset of that is content compatibility. Um, you've got to have authoring tools that are going to work on the type of mobile devices that you're looking at. So for example, you can't publish in Flash on iPhones and iPads. Um, you've got to get an authoring tool that will publish in, say, HTML5 or other, other format that's going to work with those devices. Um, the, uh, the second issue is access. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can access um, content with mobile devices. Um, a mobile-friendly LMS is one way to do that through, through a browser on any device. Um, and that's where my bias is. I think that's the best way to go is to just have a very mobile-friendly uh, learning management system where you can access it from all devices. Then your, your provider is going to be more focused on... Uh, their their application rather than having to update apps. So the second way, of course, is app accessed uh, learning management systems. Um, and the, the one of the pluses of this is sometimes this allows offline access, and this is becoming another big trend uh, in mobile learning is having offline access to training, so that you can, you know, when you don't have access to Wi-Fi or, or even a signal, you can actually complete uh, training, and then later on it'll upload that. Uh, data to your LMS. So another, another trend that, that I'm seeing is this, um, another type of cloud service is called platform as a service. Um, platforms such as uh, mobile, mobile operating systems or also platforms such as salesforce.com, you're starting to see learning tools emerge in all of those different areas. So an example of this would be um, iTunes on your, on your iPhone or on Salesforce, you can actually uh, add Blackboard, Blackboard's LMS right into, and have it integrate with, with Salesforce.com's uh, platform, which is called Force.com. So that's another aspect of mobile that's, that's important to look at. So needs assessment on, on uh, mobile learning. Um, if you have broad use of mobile devices across your organization, particularly organizations that have a lot of salespeople, that's gonna be big. Um, and if, so if you have a mobile workforce, that's a big driver. If you have a tech-savvy workforce that prefers access for multiple devices, um, that's going to be another driver. Okay, to, to start to wrap up here, we're going to look at just a couple of other important trends that are going on in learning technology. First is virtual worlds and gaming. This has been a, a really hot topic. There's a lot of great tools out there. Um, one of them that's, that's probably the best known is Second Life. You're seeing a lot of conferences uh, happen in Second Life. Um, you're seeing companies like IBM spend millions and millions of dollars. Um, but I think by 2006, they'd already spent $11 million developing a whole bunch of islands in Second Life um, where they have s simulations and, co and, and conference rooms and other places where their employees can meet and have a, a very rich experience a three-dimensional experience um, in, in training. So, you know, examples of this in education include, um, imagine having a history class where you can send your, your students into a virtual world in, in, during the, the Revolutionary War, for example, and they can actually experience what the community like was like or what that culture was like during that time period. That's a very rich and engaging experience for students. Um, other examples of that include engineers being able to go 
Um, for example, after Katrina hit uh, in New Orleans, they had someone set up a, an environment in Second Life where they could go down and analyze what what had happened uh, in the floods with uh, and and these engineers could come up with solutions um, that were based on this three dimensional world. Let's see. So we've looked at virtual worlds. Um, Offline access to e-learning, we mentioned that a little bit earlier, so that's another big trend um, that's, that's happening. And then another trend that I'm seeing a lot is with authoring tools, um, giving people really easy access to stock photos and, and other content such as videos, so that it makes it easier for them to, to publish really high quality content. So what's, what's going to be next in, in learning technology? Well, you've, some of you have heard about the, the Google, uh, Google Glasses project. Um, there's some really interesting things going on there. Don't know if that's going to catch on, but I could certainly see that being an area where learning could find it, uh, some, some interesting applications. And then I actually found online a, a company called Exact Learning in Italy. They have the first wearable learning management system. Uh, not sure where that's going or how that's going to work, but uh, kind of an interesting idea. So anyway, th th it's really exciting to see where learning technology is going. I hope this has been helpful to just kind of give you a sense for what's going on and what kind of trends are happening and where it's going to go. Um, I'm personally obviously the most excited about where SCORM is going. I think that's going to open up a, a, a whole new world for learning technology. So thanks so much for your attendance. And uh, any, any questions here?